Hello, everyone. Great to have you back for week two of the Ready to Roll Initiatives webinar. And hello to everyone who's joining us for the first time. Again, big thanks, Arish, for sponsoring these webinars. Before we get started, I just want to give you some useful information about the structure of these webinars. These webinars will be live the next four consecutive Wednesdays from 1030 to 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Since these will be webinars, only the moderator, monitor, and guest will have their audio and video hot. Intendees mics will be muted, but you will be able to ask questions via the Q&A tab. And after live broadcast, webinars will be archi archived on DC Camera's YouTube channel. We are also conducting departmental Zoom meetings, which will also be held on Wednesdays from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Zoom meetings will be an open discussion with a department, department's, departmental specific moderator. Today's Zoom meeting will be at 1.30 with the camera department, including VTR, DIT, and sound. Peter Nicole will, Nicole will moderate, and thanks, Peter, for overseeing this meeting. I have a feeling it's going to be very lively. Um, the link will be on DC Camera's Facebook page. Um, we have a lot to go over today, so let's get started. We are extremely fortunate to have two guests or have our two guests today. Both are joining us from California. David Moore, founder of the entertainment safety company, is considered the most in-demand risk manager in Hollywood. Today, after 10 years, David's team of safety officers can be found on sets all over the globe. His team of compliance officers have specialized training on health and safety precautions, per policies, and procedures related to infection prevention practices, including COVID-19 prevention, disinfection, and PPE. Who better to have on our panel to, pop, to talk about our new safety protocols and procedures than David? Thank you, David, for being on this round table. No problem. Um, I was introduced to our second guest, who I don't see on our screen yet, but I'm sure she'll pop in, Liberty Barnall, uh, when she and her business partner, husband, Brian, were guests on a Location Managers Guild International meeting on the topic of onset disinfection. Liberty and Ryan own and operate two companies based out of Southern California, Clean Start, and the disinfection supply company. Liberty and Ryan have been working as advisors in the field of field disinfection, of disinfection. Uh, helping uh, production help companies help resume, resume production in California. David, I think a lot of people on this webinar are thinking these guidelines on the task force white paper and the safe way forward are for long format productions like feature films and episodic but most of our production in this area are TV commercials, stills, documentary, and politicals. So please keep that in mind when we chat. We understand that this new position is still being working, worked out and negotiated. However, jobs are starting to roll in and our intention on this forum is to give everyone here at least the basics to start understanding what is expected when we all return to set. The union in their current Safe Way Forward guidelines call for establishing a new health safety supervisor and health safety manager. So let's start today's conversations with your thoughts on this subject. Who is this new health safety supervisor and manager and what will their role and responsibilities be? Sure, uh, great questions. Hello from my car outside of a set for anybody that just joined. Um, so, uh, there are a lot of uh, questions about how it's working out. Obviously, uh, we, well, we, a, a, a large group of, of the unions and, and um, a bunch of us were involved in, in creating some of these documents. Uh, and the theoretical that exists in the documents, some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. We've been back to work now um, legally uh, about three weeks in LA. We've been, been doing projects. Um, most of the studios have decided to do small stuff work. Um, so the idea that we would do like, you know, little, uh, it's still studio stuff, it's not exactly commercials, but it's not entirely uh, unanalogous to commercial work because it's short run stuff, a few uh, 
you know, things at a time, like a, a, a wrap ups from things that were existing before COVID. So we've had little like one week, two day projects, a lot like a commercial would be. Uh, some of the things we found are that the paperwork requirements of these new positions, health and safety supervisor and health and safety manager are much larger than we thought they would be. Uh, just managing the testing and reporting and then providing results alone for any kind of testing that we might do is pretty a pretty large job. Um, so I, I'd assume in our Safeway Forward 2 document or any updates or grades that we would, uh, upgrades we do, we're gonna look at doing, you know, some, some enhanced uh, positions, different ones, perhaps secretarial type positions or coordinator type positions. I don't know how that's gonna work out. But as of right now, it seems like the supervisor overall is designing the programs as a, as a thing and, and running it. Um, and these things might change, but as of now, like as a supervisor myself, a health and safety supervisor or operating as one, most of my time is spent interfacing, uh, you know, designing the system with the, the production in mind, because every production is a little bit different. Uh, doing things like, you know, site walkthrough ahead of time to make sure that entries and exits, uh, that we can control people through particular areas um, and that we can, you know, control access so that people, uh, whether they're, it's inadvertent or not, they don't enter the space without being checked out, however that checkout is. Uh, and then uh, interfacing with the studio, there's so many levels, at least in longer form stuff, where you have a studio, you have a production company, you might have, um, you know, variations in between, and then you actually have the, the production itself. And so these, as these levels, you have to go through these levels and everybody's got a different idea of how it's done right now. So we spend a lot, the, the supervisors, at least in, in the incarnations we have, and I think I'm consulting on about 30 shows right now, four wow. of which are in camera. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, four of which are in camera and the rest of them are in pre-production. We're doing a lot of work to try to uh, figure out exactly, uh, you know, how everybody's ideas of how this is supposed to go work. Uh, and then the and then the um, the manager uh, is becoming more of a person who's on set, uh, much like a production manager or uh, who who does operates uh, in a smaller production or in like a, a smaller regular commercial production. Um, I would envision that they're going to do a little bit more of the management on a stage, uh, and which will allow the the um, the supervisor to do their stuff uh, and, and you know walk off into a room and make phone calls all day long, which is what we've been doing. Because the second somebody tests positive, which will happen 100% on every single set, somebody will test positive, um, yeah, everything gets thrown into chaos. What do you do? Do you shut down the production? Who have they seen? They're every different district, New York, LA, Atlanta. Um, and I'm not sure yet what the rules are for DC, but it, there are different rules everywhere, let's put it that way. And so those different rules require us to figure out exactly, uh, you know, how do you comply with not only regulations that, that affect regular companies, but how do we comply with, you know, our own internal documents, whether it be with the guilds or, or what we've agreed to, um, to get our production rolling. So it's, it's a complicated process. The manager kind of runs and makes sure things like people aren't walking in and out of doors or they're not eating or they're wearing their masks. Uh, one, one of the crazy things we found is like, everybody was concerned about having single serving craft services. Um, and it turns out that like, you can't even really have craft services because you have to lift your mask to eat or take a drink of water. And that makes it, that's something we've agreed not to do on a set. So, um, you know, the, we had to create a craft services eating area, much like you would for lunch. Um, in the documents, we put down that, uh, you know, that, that like French hours would be a good idea. It turns out French hours are a terrible idea because you can't eat on the set. You can't just grab something and eat it while you're, you know, right at your station or near it. Um, you have to walk away to take your mask off. So you have to walk outside. So we found that like breaks are something we have to have, whether we want to have them or not, um, because you have to leave the set. So you know, we're finding practicalities and, and the positions are still being worked out. But I'd imagine right now, health and safety supervisor is almost an offsite remote position. Um, certainly within the documents, they're not, uh, if you look, the supervisor isn't really put into one of the zones. Uh, and, uh, and, and whereas the manager, uh, the health and safety manager 
is in a zone where we, the way we're operating on larger productions is we also have what, what uh, we're calling um, internally anyway, specialists, health and safety specialists. They're more like, a, they're not quite a PA, but, but you put them more like a, like a coordinator or APOC or something like that, where they're a little bit uh, lower down the line, but they're also um, doing the more mundane things. Like if, if, if you have, uh, if somebody has to be in each pod kind of telling people what to do. And the problem is, is you can't have people jumping from group to group to group or, or, or zone to zone to zone. I'm sorry, I keep using so many terms, the pod, bubble, zone, uh, grouping, they're all used in different documents. So we, we uh, <laughs> depending upon what document you read, you call it something different. But the idea is, is that we're, the people can't jump from group to group, no matter what. Right. Um, so that's something we're finding is like each group has to have a person. And uh, that, that makes it complicated. <laughs> Great. So, yeah. And I would think that the, um, the health safety manager would be more like a location manager who's helping, I, I'll use the word policing, just trying to keep the flow going and reminders and things like that. So, um, so what is the role and the responsibilities of the hygiene crew? Uh, once again, it's an interesting, so the first hitch we hit, and, and I think our other guests can, can, will speak to it, uh, probably better than I am, but, um, productions, I mean, we've never really thought that much about hygiene. It's, you know, a wipe down of a table at the end of the day. Um, I mean, certainly we have cleaning services and everything, but there's a big difference, um, between sterilization and cleaning. And uh, I know on, at least even on the production uh, that I'm sitting outside of right now, they hired a sterilization company and they just assumed that would mean cleaning and it doesn't. It's two completely different things. True. So um, there is, as far as the crew goes, we are, we are managing them uh, in productions, but we're a little bit like the, the testing, the, the, the uh, blood testing or the, or the nasal swab testing. It's really an outsourced project that then we manage. So there are companies that are specializing in cleaning and sterilization, and we're letting them do their thing. Right. We'll tell them, hey, you know, this is, this is, these are the high track, because they might not always know production. So right. we have to tell them, you know, don't spray here, do spray here. This is important. This isn't important. This is a green room. Nobody's going to be in there for the next two hours because talent doesn't get there for a while. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then also managing, uh, you know, any, anything as far as at what order do they do? If you clean first, you sterilize first, how does that work? You know, some, some of the systems, uh, some of the spray systems, it's better if you wipe them down afterwards. Some of the companies, they, they don't necessarily say you have to wipe them down. So we're kind of figuring that out. But, uh, but the cleaning is a, is, is a somewhat big part, but it's complicated too. Um, there are, you know, you can't use uh, bleach, for instance, on stainless steel. So you can't clean C-stands with, with bleach. You'd love to, but you shouldn't. You know, I mean, it's not going to eat it away in a day, but if that becomes a habit and we do it for, you know, two years, you're going to start to see, you know, problems. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, we do have Liberty with us. Hello, Liberty from everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. And we will get to all that uh, once we kind of finish the health safety supervisor role. And then we'll get to um, Liberty, who will definitely dial us in to cleaning and disinfection. So um, maybe, David, we just for a few more minutes, um, kind of break it down to kind of what happens during pre-production, shooting, and then any wrap. So can you please just tell us pre-production, what kind of goes on and that preparedness um, to get ready to shoot? Yeah, uh, it's a good, good uh, question. Um, pre-production, it's critical to have somebody in this new department uh, involved in pre-production. Uh, you know, I, I personally, our company has been hired on to shows, you know, that just kind of were really surprised because we didn't, nobody knew when we were going to get film permits and all of a sudden film permits were uh, issued and it's like, you know, can you have somebody here tomorrow? Sure. But if we weren't involved in the pre-production, there were big holes, um, you know, and gaps. Like for instance, one of the shows had everybody tested and then the testing company said, you know, okay, well, who's going to read the results? And that hadn't been determined yet and that there are HIPAA uh, ramifications to that. Right. So we sat literally 
uh, you know, an hour outside um, the studio trying to figure out who was, who was okay to do that. And my, our company does it. It's just, it, there's a paperwork process to it. Um, so uh, it's critical to be in the pre-production process. We, we've spent a lot of our time uh, in the real world um, creating the documents, getting them approved by the different guilds. Um, they all want to see it right now. So DGA and IA, um, SAG to some extent, kind of, I don't even know, to be honest, if how much they're, they're going through it with a fine tooth comb, but they definitely want to see you have a plan. They definitely want to, it can't be a one pager, you know, it's got to be a fairly significant plan. Um, we've spent a lot of time preparing those documents and then revising them too, as, as each new, for instance, uh, for New York, the guidelines came out, I think it was Friday, um, and, and they have some significant uh, while while they the spirit of them is, is similar, they have some significant differences between um, and and additions. Some things are a little looser, but most things are a little tighter. Like their contact tracing after after a positive is kind of ambitious at best, um, and there there is no way to do what they want right now. So uh, we're spending a lot of our time trying to figure out. Okay, theoretically, you know, here here's our document. You know, how much do you commit to in your document? Um, because you can you can just pair it one of these, you know, Safeway Ford or something. And uh, if, if the, you know, if you do that, you know, you're, you're also as, as a company committing to a whole lot of stuff you may not completely understand um, or the complexity or the expense of it. So we're suggesting to people in pre-production, you know, hey, you, you really got to decide like, what do you want to do? Do you want to commit? If you say like, for instance, actors are tested, uh, let's say you're doing four or five days if it's a commercial, um, and you say your actors are tested every day. Well, what does that mean? You know, getting getting swabbed, that means getting swabbed before, and that means getting swabbed four days in a row. I've done it. You know, you got to start worrying about your, your, your actor having a bloody nose or their voice changing by the end of it. I mean, it, it literally is, it's not painful. It's just uncomfortable. Um, and then in production, you know, we're putting out, we're, we're spending a lot of time putting out fires, figuring out, I mean, it's, it's early days. You'll go through your early day period as well. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, of, of realistic stuff versus, versus kind of theory. And it's a little like war, like they say, that once the bullets start, everything, you know, kind of goes, all your plans go out the window. And, and it's that way. I, I don't know that um, we've had a bunch of studios that have, have uh, or productions anyway, that have had these very complicated uh, procedures, bubble procedures, where you know they had eight different zones, and and you know nobody was going to interact with everything, and that lasted 20 minutes on average on most sets. So um, I think the more simpler, safe way forward, three zones, that seems to work. Like we can kind of make that happen, uh, but but anything super complicated tends to fall apart, as it does in life. Right. Um, yeah, and then you know, wrap is wrap. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's it, once after a few days, people get it going. I, I will say to everybody, like during the production phase, it's actually, you know, part of our fear was how is, is all, is all these, are, are all these additional restrictions going to cause us problems uh, in terms of speed and, you know, how are we going to go? Uh, I don't, it's weird working a 10 hour day for me. I don't know what your average days are there, but Mom. it's pretty yeah, it's strange to go home and the sun's still out for me, you know. Um, but but uh, but a ten hour day uh, is is very welcome, um, and that's one of the things that most of the documents suggest is that we go to a ten hour. Um, we found that production is actually quite normal once you once you get going. You know, there's there's time lost in testing, there's money in days, you know, and 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 things lost in a testing day. Uh, but other than that you know, when we're actually on the stage, cameras are rolling, it, it, it feels pretty similar. Uh, the time is not as, you know, you can kind of, kind of get along, get, get through your pages like you would normally. Right. Um, yeah, there are you, you go. Guys, are you guys scheduling in little uh, breaks during the day for people to get away from each other, take their masks off, get some fresh air? I, I wish we were scheduling time to get away from each other. That would be awesome. I get tired of these people. Um, no, we are, for sure. Um, the thing is, a mask, one of the problems is that, you know, the masks are just uncomfortable. I, I don't know uh, how many, I mean, we wear masks out here in California, pretty much have to. And, um, but, but even having done that for a few months now, um, and I'm pretty good about it. It's my job. I should be wearing a mask in public. 
uh, I don't think I realized how uncomfortable they are to live for 12 hours. And, um, you know, so one of the things there's a little uh, that, that we've discovered is like those little barrette looking holders that kind of pull the masks back off your ear. Those are really a lifesaver. I, I you know, so one of the one of the PAs walked up to me and said, "Have you tried one of these? Because it makes masks a lot better." And um, yeah, absolutely. Those are they're awesome. So little little tricks like that, but we definitely do. Um, we've scheduled. We found that like having an indoor eating area is, uh, regardless of temperature, we, we've been we had a couple days that were you know around ninety. I mean, it doesn't have the humidity you do, but um, we found that people just want to get outside and see the sun um, when they're shooting on stages. So having just pop-ups, we've done pop-ups uh, for eating and people appreciate that. And it's safer anyway. There, there's almost no transmission outside um, that they've been able to find in the contact tracing uh, countries, not ours, but um, there's very little transmission outside. Right. So, uh, you know, as a real thing, I mean, we can talk theoretical, but could it happen? Absolutely. But um, it's the best place to take a mask off. So what we've done, and that's that's one of the problems with, like stage doors is that uh, we will let people go outside and take breaks, not not fully shut down, but maybe, you know, let a second or an assistant or something go outside, you know, during during a setup or something like that. Um, and they can go out and stand alone and take their mask off. We kind of have told people, look, do that outside the stage. And uh, and and it, and it works out fine. And, and, and I think people really, really need those those moments. Right. So who's responsible for providing the PPE to the crew and the cast and the clients? Um, and then how should we properly dispose of that at the end of the day? Great questions. Um, so there's, there's uh, once again, reality versus, versus theoretical a lot in these two questions. Um, we have found, uh, so as you know, I am not a uh, virologist of any kind, nor am I a doctor. I do have a medical background. But I am, I am not, um, uh, all of my information comes from um, consultants that, that my company has. But having said that, the one piece of PPE that matters above all else is a mask. Nothing else, everything else is kind of window dressing. Um, even, even to some extent, you know, gloves just, trans, I mean, there's no difference between your hand and gloves, for instance. Um, gloves just can transmit things and move things around just as much. It's just you're doing it without touching it with your hands. Uh, so the mask is critical. And, and even face shields, goggles, those kind of things. Ocular transmission is, is a theory. It's not really something we know happens, but we definitely know it transmits by breath. So we have found with PPE that the majority of people are bringing their own masks because in each of our urban areas, they already have them. Right. Um, there are specific rules and laws to N95s. Uh, so we, you have to be specially trained um, to do that. So that's a big uh, problem for productions because, you know, it, it is a hands-on class, which is something we're trying not to do. Right. Um, Can we just back up there for a second? Yeah. So yeah. just to clarify what that means, what I have learned from an OSHA trainer is that Honestly, unless you're in the hair, makeup, wardrobe department, because that's the most vulnerable department, that really, if you have a mask, a regular medical mask, that's a two or three, you're okay. If you go into the N95, then that's all that training and, and really not necessary. Is that correct? It's, it's true. And, and I would also caution everybody that N95s, you know, they're, they're designed to protect the wearer not everybody else. So for instance, there's an entire class of N95s, which, which I'm sure many people have seen that have the little uh, uh, air release nipple on them. And that actually is bad. That's actually really bad because the thing that masks are for um, and, and the cell to the crews in the safety talks is masks aren't to protect you breathing bad air in. Masks are to protect you exhaling bad air out just in case. So by wearing your mask, you're actually protecting the rest of the crew, not, not vice versa. Um, so it becomes much less at, with that argument about individual choice and more about protecting the group. So we as a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a much easier pitch that way. And so what we've been, you know, trying to advise people is that, look, you know, if you bring your own mask from home, that's adequate. Because one of our problems is uh, how do you, how do you walk from the parking lot, you know, into the stage or, or through our screening process if you don't have, 
you know, if we're providing masks inside, right? So people are, have to have their mask in their pocket anyway. So we might as well let them wear them, right? right? So to your question directly about PPE, who provides it? The production company has been buying it. Um, yeah. We've been distributing it. Um, most of my, so I, uh, this is part of the bit larger conversation, but um, I, I work for the bigger studios. Um, some of them uh, like Amazon and Netflix, who are both uh, my clients, have been obvious, you know, continuing to work during the period. So some of the larger studios are having a little bit of problem, not problem, but um, they are finding their PPE sources. And, and uh, if, if they had shut down a little bit more, they're, they're having a little bit more difficulty than like, for instance, Amazon, who already was providing all kinds of things and had a route right. and, you know, has pallets of things delivered. But what we're finding is like, everybody's already got their PPE. So we're going through hand sanitizer, but, uh, and maybe the occasional face shield, but the face shields that, for instance, we bought, um, you know, just to kind of like, oh, let's buy 10 face shields and have them, you know, in our kit, just in case, you know, hair and makeup needs it or whatever. Hair and makeup day one said to, said to us on, on one production, ah, the, I can't, I can't do this. I can't use this face shield. Look through it. And, I, you know, I put it on, look through it and said, absolutely. It looks, you know, foggy and, you know, th th there's no way you want somebody applying eyeliner, you know, to, to a, a semi-famous person wearing one of these things because the optics just aren't good enough. Yeah. So, you know, um, we're, we, we went out and, you know, obviously that, you know, surgeons wear them. There's a brand, there's a kind that surgeons can wear when they operate. So you can find ones that have clarity so we can still continue with the rules. But, uh, you know, we, we found we had to do that. You can't just buy the cheap knockoffs. Um, Right. But I, you know, I, I think we're giving away maybe uh, 10 masks a week. I mean, we have boxes and boxes of sur surgical masks uh, and nobody wants them. They're all, they're all wearing their own. Got it. All right. Great. And then, you know, what's the medic's role in all this? I mean, so, I mean, Hopefully I know nothing, <laughs> you know, um, to deal with accidents like they always have been, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so as a, I come from a risk management side, I am a medic. So, so I never worked as a set medic, but, but I am a medic. Um, so I have a soft spot for them. But having said that, it's important for the medic to, to do their job and, and be ready to do their job, which is in set in the case of an emergency, be there. Um, so people have said, can we combine this position with medic? Can they get involved? Sure, you know, to, to an extent, because most medics don't do anything until they're needed. Um, you can have them help check, check temperatures, uh, you know, or be involved in, in some smaller role. But one of the problems, like one of the sets, uh, you know, had the medic checking all the temperatures and then something happened. It was minor. It was nothing, just a, you know, a little trip, but they had to go check it out. Well, suddenly the door is unguarded essentially because they were the one guarding it, checking temperatures. So if you do that, you know, and, and then, you know, nobody had been, nobody had been taught to take temperatures. So what do you do? You know, like you have a PA take temperatures. Well, that's not really cool HIPAA wise, right. we think. Um, so you really don't want to involve them too much. Uh, but it is, it is hard to have a medical problem and then, you know, have them sitting around doing nothing. I, I get that, you know, right. as, as a thing. And they're all interested in getting involved too. I think, I think our rate's a little bit higher. For, right. for, a, for an H&S. So they're, they're definitely interested and in, in, in engaging with us in that. Um, specifically on, you know, just as a note, you'll, you'll see that most of the documents um, specify that uh, whoever are these new positions, this, this new department is not union because they, uh, they, there are a lot, I'm sure as anybody who, if, if there's production managers or, or uh, uh, you know, any kind of line producer out there, there, there are complicated issues with one union member of one guild telling another union member to do something. And so I think to avoid that, at least initially, that was, you know, one of the things, make this a non-union position. Not that everybody isn't going to be clamoring to try to unionize it eventually, I'm sure they will. But, uh, but right now it makes it a lot easier because it's hard for like a medic to tell a te teamster, for instance, to do something. Um, their guilds have to talk. Right. you know, for the most part, and, and it's complicated. So they just kind of sidestep all those rules by making it a non-union thing right now. Great, great, thank you. Yeah. So the health safety supervisor will, and I don't want to use the word have the power, let's say we'll have the authority to shut down a set. 
to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, completely shut down would mean a COVID positive threat. Shutting down or pausing may be a better word if things were going too fast or if we needed to just take a minute to adjust something. Can you speak to that? Yeah, it's awesome to have that power. I love it. Um, super excited to have my finger on the button. Um, I mean, in some ways, we always, uh, as, a as a person who's done risk management, we always kind of had that power anyway because our job was to determine, look, there's a danger and you know you had this un unspoken power to do that you know hey we can't do this scene or we have to do it a different way or whatever it is um so for me and my people it's not really that big of a difference but having said that it, it's definitely a danger especially as the market floods with people that don't really understand how production works and how much money it costs to shut a set down um we're we're developing uh so what's come to kind of the head and this is not me actually this was not my idea but, uh, but a friend of mine who's, who's a, a, a UPM in New York said, you know what we need? We need an if then. And we need, we need a, an if then procedure because every time somebody tests positive on a set, um, and I mean, I, we don't have enough time in this call to get into how crazy testing is and right. false positives, even though there really aren't false negatives. I mean, there's, there's a world out there and those tests are at best good estimates whether you have it or not, um, no matter what test it is. Uh, and I know that's scary, but that's the truth. And so we need an if-then matrix really as a, as a uh, whole group of people um, as an industry to say like, okay, if it, if it shuts down, this is what you do. And it really doesn't exist. The rules are murky. Uh, and, and, you know, kind of our, our guidelines, we've kind of found out what it is, but, you know, for instance, they use terms like, like, close contact for 15 minutes. Well, what does that mean in a row? Does that mean over a day? Does that mean you wrote a production ban with them? Um, Europe has gone, you know, there's a six foot rule. Europe just, uh, or uh, the UK anyway, just decided it was a, a one meter rule, which is more like three feet. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the idea of, of, okay, you know, like the New York document that, that was referenced earlier um, had said that, that after, after cleaning, everybody can go back to work immediately, um, provided you weren't in close contact. And, but they don't define that, um, or at least it's not defined very well. So um, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're hoping to get that idea of, of an if then, this is what you do, but it, it definitely throws things. Uh, one of our sets shut down for the day, everybody went home. Um, so if you look at some of the fed, more federal guidelines on what to do, CDC guidelines, um, they say that that uh, everybody needs to be tested. Uh, the, the two tests within 24 hours that are negative are, you know, fine. And we we had the same. I had a couple crew members on a on a set test positive. They both we immediately tested them again. They both came back negative to, uh, for three additional tests after they tested positive. So can they go back to work? I don't know. You know, that's an open that's an open question. Um, on a short show, no. Why? You know, it, it, there's there's zero chance of them giving it to anybody if they don't go back, and you're only on a two or three day run anyway. Right. On a longer thing, you know, it, it becomes a problem. Right. Great. And again, for this next question, just keep in mind our region is a lot of TV commercials, not sure. the features episodic. Um, what is your advice for producers and production companies? Should they have their own policies and procedures in place and make that available to the crew? talent and clients before we step fat foot on set. And uh, we also need to know in advance how the policies and procedures are going to be implemented. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would suggest it's very difficult to do. Uh, if you do try to do your own policies and procedures, um, it's, it's a very, at least at this point, it's a very laborious process. Um, and, and the rules are changing so quickly I would imagine that it's, 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 it's easier, at least for a company. I mean, I'm not pitching my own, but for, for you to just outsource that and let them modify a, uh, there really isn't a boilerplate, but it's getting there to the point where I, you know, I, I have a document I can tell you, okay, well, this will get approved, you know, by DGA for the most part. So I think it's better to pay for a document like that and let somebody fill in and let that change dynamically as a, as a group, just kind of start using the same thing. If you try to write it from scratch, it, it might work, but it's, it, it takes, anybody who's tried that has, has found that it takes 
a lot of effort and and you keep finding new and things that keep popping up as opposed to calling somebody and going hand me the latest revision um we do not uh as a uh, as a policy we're trying to eliminate any kind of uh, uh paper real paper transactions so like iipps and things like that that would normally exist um copies of this as as people have called for uh we're we're what we've done on most of the stages, I mean, just what my company's done is we put up QR codes and it says, you know, if you want a copy of them, you know, hit this QR code on your phone. If you have Android or Apple uh, phone, the cool thing is like, you don't even need to open a special program or anything anymore. You just point your camera at it and boom, it'll pop up and, and send you to a link or whatever you want to do. So we found that that's a really easy way to do it. We, we want to make every document available, but we also, you know, don't necessarily want people, uh, you know, leafing through anything. Right. We don't want them signing anything. We don't want them holding all the same pen on any given day. I mean, everything has to be, um, all acknowledgements have to be digital. Uh, there's a lot of complicated stuff with paperwork. Right, and in Google, a Google Doc could be sent out digitally that has something on it. Absolutely. Got yeah, it. absolutely, yeah. Um, okay, we've heard stories already of crew being masked up and following all the guidelines, and then the client shows up and refuses to wear a mask. What should we do in that situation? Well, to, to uh, in a union show, it's really simple because because you you have agreed to the different guilds that you know you you have you'd agree to follow these rules. So essentially, you know, it's the union people will should or can walk off the show. I mean, they're they're not. I mean, we all have to be careful about this, but it is your health and your family's health. Um, so one thing I've I've I will tell everybody, um, because I've, I never had to do it before, but, but uh, there's a thing, I've had to tell several people now that they've tested positive. And I don't think, I know I did not anticipate it. It's a little bit like telling somebody that, uh, that a relative died. It's very difficult. And the first call, almost to a person, the first call has been to their significant other, not to their production company, their guild, their whoever it might be, it's to been to their significant other. And they've said, you know, paraphrasing, honey, I am so sorry, but like I we get, get the guest bedroom made up, you know, let's get the kids tested. I may have infected everybody by being on this set. I mean, it's a very emotional and traumatic thing to the point where we've actually brought a psychologist or a psychiatrist on to our staff to deal with that because our people have to do this. Um, and it's a difficult conversation to have. Um, so, I think these are the things that that producers and, and and clients need to understand that you know you're putting by by not being there you're putting everybody else at risk especially uh and and back to the health and safety manager this is part of the hardest part of this job is that there are people like i've had location managers that's, that have said well what do you mean i can't just walk onto the set it's like no fly in and fly out positions don't exist anymore like you're either in our group or you're not in our group that's it um, and, and you're, you're around the camera or you're not, you can come into, you know, an outer zone, but you cannot walk up and actually put lot, eyes on the set. Right. And, and that, that's going to be a tough thing. And, and, and so even with clients, you know, there is video village is all going to be virtual. That has to, they have to live with that. They can't walk up and be a part of the magic that is filmmaking. Um, and that's hard. It's really hard. And it's a conversation that, it's why also having um, the manager and, and the supervisor uh, with some experience and a little bit of gravitas, because that's, that is their job is to, is to keep everybody safe. It's not to save money and it's not to make people feel good. It's to make sure that the crew doesn't get transmitted this crazy disease that, that attacks, you know, I, it's not, it's not just a little respiratory disease. It attacks organs and it, and it kills people. And, um, you know, we're, we, we have to convey that message and it's hard to do. Right. So last week, one of our guests shared that in her contract with the agency and client, they state that everyone has to wear a mask at all times or she would shut down her own production. Here's an update from last week. Since last week, she has revised, wait a minute, um, she, re she revised her client waiver to include the term where they have to agree wearing masks when they arrive to set 
It's non-negotiable, regardless of federal or state or local mandates for the location of where that shoot is. And I think that's smart because it nips it in the bud prior to us getting there. So it's a non-issue when we're actually on the set on the shoot day. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, so as employers, uh, you know, and, and I am not a contract lawyer once again, it's just what I pretend to be, you know, a lot of days. Um, so please don't take my word as, as, as gospel. But um, unfortunately with, with masks, it's become a political issue. I am apolitical, I don't care. I care about people coming home and, and not catching the disease. So regardless of what a person's uh, opinions are on individual liberty, we have hard data that says masks work and masks keep people from getting this thing and it cuts down transmission radically. So the use of masks on a set is absolutely just a thing that, that we need to somehow enforce. Um, however, the guilds have all, for the most part, very strongly said, hey, no waivers, don't sign waivers. You're not allowed to sign addendums, waivers, whatever. We'll give you guidance on any of that. So one of the problems we're running into is like if you, if you declare um, any rules that are outside of you know, what, what the normal agreements are or the negotiated contracts, uh, there is an issue. Um, they've been told not to sign those kind of things. So um, it, it gets into really dicey contract law. And it's definitely something you need to know that you, you might very well, you can try to implement it and I suggest you do, but, but you, know, you also get to this point where people potentially could just say, hey, my guild said, no, I can't sign anything that you know, our contract is our contract. So uh, with non-union, obviously it's a little easier, but, but, but it's certainly something to think about that, that they've been told not to let, let the larger guild make your decisions in terms of policies and procedures. Great. So we're gonna bring Liberty into this discussion to talk about hygiene and disinfection, which is you know, relatively new and very, very serious. So I kind of wanna make this, this uh, statement as a department head, and I feel really strongly about this because I have been really researching and doing a lot of research on this topic of disinfection. Um, so I believe that cleaning and disinfecting sets should not be the job of a production assistant. They are not cleaning professionals. It is dangerous. And this discussion that we're about to go into, you'll see. Um, it's dangerous and it's just not cool. Producers should put cleaning and disinfection services into their budgets and hire professionals. Sets should be clean and disinfected before the crew arrives. And then there should be a person on the shoot day that is solely responsible for the continual cleaning and disinfection of high touch areas, bathrooms, hand washing stations, tables and chairs, and all the high touch areas. These young eager PAs are entering our workforce to learn filmmaking, not to become cleaners, especially during a pandemic. So Liberty, hello. <laughs> hello. What a great statement, Caprice. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more, obviously being one of those professionals, but I think it's really important for everyone to understand that um, disinfection is a serious thing. It should always be. Our company has done it for years, but especially now. So yeah, those PAs need to focus on the production, not the cleaning and disinfection. Okay, so we're going to talk about chemicals on set um, yeah. because we're, we're going to be using disinfection um, to keep everybody safe. safe. So um, having chemicals on set is not to be taken lightly, and that's another reason to hire professionals. Um, and especially now, like if we, you know, we're typically used to sending PAs out on runs and to the store to pick up what we need. Um, but these chemicals that should be used that are on the EPA end list, you can't get at Target. And anything that kills any kind of germs that's going to be effective are not even on the shelves right now. Anything that's on the shelves are not killing germs. Um, you need, to need disinfections that states that it kills 99.9 .9 or 99.99 .99 of germs. And those basic ho ho house household cleaners aren't even at your local stores. I mean, has anybody been able to get Clorox wipes in the last three months? <laughs> yeah. um, and the government has standards to adhere to re 
to, wait a minute, let me start over. The government has standards to adhere to, wait a minute, regard, wait a minute. The government has standards regarding chemicals at a workplace and our sets are considered a workplace. Yeah, so the topic of chemicals is a hot one. You know, everyone focuses just on disinfection in general and it really, it blows me away sometimes when we get calls into places where there's food or something's being manufactured for children or whatever that might be. And they don't even really care what we're spraying. It just kill it, you know, kind of thing. And I think we even feel that way sometimes in our home. Some of my friends who were so into non-toxic, chemical-free are saying, you know, bring it on, whatever it takes to get rid of this stuff. But I think we need to back up because chemicals, everything you just said, Caprice, is true. You know, the chemicals on list end are available in the household. I mean, bleach is on list end, but we need to understand the difference between the chemicals, what is more dangerous than others, um, and also the, the actual kill time or, you know, what is going to, how, how much time it takes for um, coronavirus. We'll just speak specifically about it to die, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand that bleach, you know, it kills, but it takes 10 minutes. And if you think about it, are we really saturating things for 10 minutes to ensure that coronavirus is gone if we're using something like bleach, no. So first and foremost, we need to understand the differences. Um, and list N is complicated in itself. You know, a lot of it is brand names listed and then you can find a generic version, but it's been, it's been confusing. And again, that's part of the reason why we leave it up to the professionals to handle the disinfection rather than hoping that whatever we can find at the store will do the job. Um, so there's, you know, chemicals that are very dangerous yet effective. And then there's also chemicals or what I like to call solutions that are not dangerous. My whole take on when we go in and disinfect now is we don't want to replace one danger with another. So, um, our company prefers to use chemicals that are non-toxic and chemical free. Um, so I don't know if you want me to go into that. <laughs> I can talk forever on this. So. I, I know. I kind of have a list that we can just kind of go okay, down, down the list. So um, let's back up a second. Okay. Give us the basics when it comes to cleaning for health, because that's what we're doing now. We are cleaning for health. And what's the difference between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfection and disinfecting? Yeah. Yes. So I love that David already touched on it a bit and you did as well. Um, you know, cleaning is just aesthetically pleasing. Um, you know, a gal that helps me clean up my house is on her way here and love her, but she's not focused on disinfection. She's going to make my counter shine and everything sparkly. Um, disinfecting is using a particular chemical to actually kill germs, viruses, microbes, etc. Um, and same with sanitizing, uh, essentially. So to just ease confusion and keep things simple, sanitizing and disinfecting are in one category, cleaning is in another. So mentioned earlier, um, David had said, uh, you know, it was surprising that a company was called to disinfect and cleaning wasn't even part of their protocol. They were disinfecting. So, you know, very significant difference. We want to absolutely destroy anything dangerous um, on a set or in a workplace. Right. Um, so when disinfecting, um, what are the roles? You have to actually clean first with soap and water. And then could you expand on how, when we're covering with this application, please explain what the dwell times are and why it's so important. Yeah. So uh, you don't necessarily have to clean every surface with soap and water. Ideally, the cleanest surface will get completely disinfected, the best case scenario, right? But if you're thinking, like we're, we have one of our technicians out at a home right now in LA, and it's an old home where it's not realistic for him to take soap and water over the entire home, indoors and outdoors to disinfect. So think purely of looking at a surface, if there's dirt and heavy dust on it, should you wipe it first? Yes, but generally speaking, if a surface or area or location has been generally cleaned, a disinfecting company can come in and use their various spraying and fogging devices and do a very good job of disinfecting without soap and water taken to every surface and part of, so I kind of want to back up a little bit, ideally clean first, then disinfect. Right. Um, what was the second part to your question? Dwell times. Dwell times. So yeah, I call, it, I call it kill times. That's what our industry, but dwell time is a little softer. So dwell times simply mean how long does it take for that disinfectant 
to kill, and we'll again talk just coronavirus. So the EPA's list N actually lists the dwell time or kill time of those disinfectants. So it's easy to look up in a public forum. Um, the, the disinfecting company that might be called onto a set should know that. Um, again, there's different, I would say chemicals vary in terms of dwell or kill time and in terms of danger. So when we were also talking about if there's a, po a positive COVID within um, a production team and then there's time taken away to disinfect properly, sometimes there's also time that needs to be left for that disinfectant to be considered gone or the area safe to return to. Again, there are disinfectants that are safer where there could even be people in an area where a disinfectant is being sprayed without any um, cause for concern. So dwell time can range from 30 seconds is typically the minimum to 10 minutes is typically the longest. Right, right. And all that information is actually on the manufacturer's labels of all those um, solutions, disinfections. So, well, yeah, and Caprice, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Sometimes they do not list their dwell time. So that's really important to know. Like if you look at Clorox bleach, it does not list the dwell time. And that's been a cause of, you know, concern for many people of if you hire a service to come in and they bleach is their preferred method and they use the bleach and then wipe it right off, they're not really killing coronavirus. So that's one thing to know is you have to research deeper. You need to use the internet, especially list N. Just look up all the tools that are provided. Perfect. We have a ton of unusual gear that is unique to our industry and is shared on set. Grip and electric, prop set dressing. How should we be disinfecting our gear? No, let's take out the electronic issue of it right now. Just yes. kind of just gear gear. Um, and also items that are delivered on set, like tables and chairs, how should we be disinfecting those things? And David, I'm not sure if you're there too, but if you have your thoughts on disinfection procedures, we're all ears. Yeah, so the hottest topic we've encountered on set is the cameras, obviously, and electronics, and we've okay. left it up to them. <laughs> um, our job has been to provide the right chemical or solution and some different methods. So you have to consider, you know, the application of disinfectant. There really aren't that many ways to apply a disinfectant, right? Theoretically, a mop can do it. Um, we prefer microfiber towels in terms of wiping or once we've let a disinfectant sit and we do want to dry the space, microfiber is always the best. There's also spraying of varied kinds. Electrostatic spraying is the hot one that, you know, had the most press over the last few months and it has its benefits and it's it's parts that aren't so great. There's also fogging devices or atomizing foggers that not only disinfect surfaces, but also the air, because if they're not electrostatic, the molecules are remaining in the air and then eventually falling down because of gravity, where electrostatic doesn't really stay in the air because it wants to gravitate toward other surfaces. So and those are- Your company it, sells those. So can you expand yeah. a little bit more on the fogging? Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah, we hit a point a couple months into coronavirus <laughs> and the situation after millions of dis millions of square feet of disinfection where a lot of people said, how can we do this more ourselves? It doesn't make sense to constantly have someone in our space disinfecting. We can't. Um, so, you know, keep in mind electrostatic spraying, although very thorough, it can be dangerous in that the sprayers can shock the user. And so we didn't really want to sell something that would shock people. We deal with that enough ourselves. But foggers, there's a few different things to know about foggers. When you find a, a fogger, the right kind of fogger, it should reduce the solution that's in that fogger to teeny tiny microns. And the idea of a fogger is also to wrap around anything that you're spraying it toward um, and also fog the air in any surface. But essentially, it's an applicator. It's a way to apply disinfectant that is effective, it's efficient. And so we do sell those um, for that same reason. We wanted our clients or potential clients to know that they can, in between us coming with our electrostatic sprayer, also fog the area. Um, so think of sets, even think of, just picture something like a hair salon where that salon owner does not have the ability to hire a service every day. So at the end of the day, any business, any business, including yours, can disinfect very thoroughly, effectively, and efficiently. Right. I just want to note we're at 1126. I had a feeling that this discussion would go a little over an hour, and I think it's imperative that it does. So I'm hoping our guests can stay with us and all of our attendees. Um, 
So just a couple of things to touch upon. We talked about the EPA end list. Um, and also too, when in doubt, read the labels and use as directed. Um, but also, uh, Liberty, you also sell disinfecting generators. And when we hear the word generator, mm -hmm. we think of, you know, 500 amp um, generators that are towed by a, a pickup truck that powers our set. And that's not what you're selling. So can no. you <laughs> So what I'm talking about is this device. <laughs> so it kind of looks like a Brita. Um, but believe it or not, there is some magic in this device. So um, one way to generate or um, to, you know, use a device to make your own hospital grade EPA approved on list end disinfectant is to create something called electrolyzed water. Electrolyzed water is also called hypochlorous acid. And before March, not a whole lot of people have heard about hypochlorous acid, but it's been around for many, many years and very popular in Europe and Asia. Um, if you've ever seen some of the videos of school children in Asia being sprayed down <laughs> as they go into their school, <laughs> these are little munchkins. Um, it, they're okay because it's actually hypochlorous acid. Um, imagine those school children. Picture my house. I have a seven-year-old and my husband is spraying <laughs> down. Um, so this, this device, and there's other devices out there, but we found this one to be the best. Um, you literally put water and salt in this device and it can be any kind of hypochlorous acid generator. There's a button that you start, you run it for as little as five minutes to as many as 30 or 60, depending on how strong um, you would like the solution. And then once it's done electrolyzing the water, the pH may move a little bit. So you add in some vinegar. So you literally take three natural ingredients salt, water, vinegar, turns in, it, it's a very simple chemical reaction that we probably learned about in sixth grade and we didn't remember until now. Um, but the, the hypochlorous acid, it stays bind um, or bound for up to two weeks. The one thing to remember about something like that is the molecules want to return to their original state so they can, you know, re-separate. But hey, if you've got your own generator, you make it every day. So what I like to do is I run the generator two times to make a very strong solution. I measure it with parts per million measuring strips. Um, I dilute it into water and I keep five gallons at a time. This is what we disinfect everything with. We used to use a plethora of very dangerous chemicals, but frankly, it didn't feel good to tell our clients that we were resolving one problem with another. Um, in terms of spraying their area with toxic, potentially cancer-causing chemicals. And now that we're doing it so much more often, it's even more important to realize what is actually in your disinfectant. Um, so that is a device that we, we use and love. We have some different versions that make more chemicals at once, but it's very simple. We were looking for a simple, cost-effective solution that people can do in any workplace, at their home, et cetera. That's toxic, that's green, that's safe, that's... Pet yep, pet non-toxic, pet. green, it's safe for the environment, people, plants, pets. Um, my dog has not grown a third year, so we're doing okay. <laughs> Great. So, um, okay, so note, uh, electronics and camera gear, disinfection, we would urge everyone to read the PERG document that was written specifically for grip and electric gear, motion picture cameras, um, and we'll post that document. Um, and I'm sure, Arish, you can put that on your um, Facebook page as well for your guys. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Sounds good. Caprice, do you want me to share our website? Um, yeah, please. Okay. I, so if I type it in the message, will everyone see that in the chat? I think so. In the chat, we can okay. put that in the chat. I'm not sure where Dave, uh, where Patrick went. David, are you good with time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, please. I actually, yes, I am. I'm sitting here in my head running the li idiocracy lines. What what are electrolytes? You know, we're creating them, right? So who knew we would say that? Thank you, Mike Judd. I, I envision the, the world 500 years from now, and <laughs> it's not good. Because um, you're spraying everybody, you know? Like, I don't know. It's funny. <laughs> okay, here's a question for you, David. How does a person get certified to be a supervisor or the manager? Great question. So, uh they don't is the answer um there is no so all all the documentation calls for that calls for a um certification uh or or a, a uh, somebody who's 
they are uh, uh, knowledgeable in these areas. Um, the truth of the matter is there, there isn't like a class or a degree or anything you can take or do. So um, we've, we've gone, there, there are some programs with like uh, WHO um, that we've sent people through. Uh, we have our own internal risk management program, which is usually a six month training program we've used for our people. So we've just modified that. Um, but I would suggest that, that a background in one of three areas and then an apprenticeship is, is the way that we're looking to do it. Um, starting with like a lower level, like I said, we're calling them specialists, and then they would move up the ladder uh, as they gain experience. But um, an, a background in, in risk management, a background in medical work, like a nurse or, or obviously a, a EMT or, or some kind of medic, um, and or a, and or a uh, background in, in film production, um, preferably a little bit more than a PA, but, um, you know, depending upon how you want to go, like we're just, it's such a complicated thing, and the questions come from every spectrum, whether it be from post or whether it be from wardrobe lockups. And it's just like a production manager, ideally, if they if they could take the somewhat rate cut would be the perfect kind of person. It requires a real large knowledge of not only how productions work, but also, you know, uh, how all of this stuff works as well. So it seems About like- location a yeah, location lo managers. Yeah. Location managers. Yeah, location managers are great. I mean, they would they would be obviously they they you know get their long list of things they have to look at and and you know half my time uh, certainly before all of this I spent talking to location managers because it would be like okay is this safe you know let's get environmental reviews let's do whatever it might be and um, yeah so LMs are great ALMs you know anybody who's been in production and understands a little bit of the larger picture uh, would be would be ideal for the job. Right. Um, yeah, I would, I'd suggest, you know, anybody who's bored in their career or topped out to give it a shot. I mean, I know we're going to have to hire hundreds of people. I mean, the idea, I've lobbied for it for 10 years and never gotten anywhere, but um, the idea of a health and safety person, uh, even one on every set, uh, was like a fantasy six months ago for, for us. Um, and now, not only is it required, we're looking more at, you know, four or five potentially. So, uh, and they just, and we're, we're trying to be honest, hey, you know, we have people that can come in as the supervisor or the manager, but, but really we're having to train local for the, for the lower level people because it's just, Maybe. they don't, there's not thousands of people out there that have these experiences, you know, or have the experience to do it. Right. So we have another question. So if we're doing a 10 hour day, how often should we be taking temperatures? Um, once, in my opinion, I, you know, I, I, you know, let me, let me disclaim that I'm not a big fan of temperatures. I think they're great to make people feel good, but they really, they're only one symptom. Um, we could just as easily be checking people multiple times a day to see if they have COVID toe, and it would be just about as effective. Um, temperatures are great. The problem with them is that um, anybody who's, I don't know if anybody's done it, but anybody who has done it will find the very first thing is that the temperature guns don't read 98.7. They read something else. Um, and that's dependent upon air conditioning or, uh, you know, moisture content or, or whether people are working inside or outside. There's a whole bunch of reasons why those things aren't accurate. So in our documents, you know, they, they set, they've set specific temperature degree ranges, 100.4 or whatever it might be. And uh, when you shoot 30 crew members and everybody's coming up at 96, 96.5, you know, you kind of, you look at that and think, well, okay, that's fine, but but does that mean I, I have to transpose everything up two degrees? Because I know the average temperature is somewhere you know around 98 um, for people. And then, so what does that mean? Like, if everything's shooting low, does that mean if somebody comes in and shoots at 99, or do they actually have a fever of 101? And and you can get fevers from all kinds of things, not just COVID, right? So, um, for for us, like we're doing it once a day. Um, there are, I, I did actually look through the Q&A a little myself, and, and there are some weird eccentricities to it um, through HIPAA. So for instance, uh, you are not, and this is all coming to light, and there probably are more, so I'm not the end all, but um, you are allowed, um, and, and even in many places required, to record people's temperatures if that's, if that's one of your checks. Um, they can self-record or you can do it yourself. As a production company, if you do it yourself, you're allowed to record it but you are not allowed to record the temperature. You're only allowed to record whether they passed or they failed. Right. Really weird little eccentricity, right? But, but like the temperature is actually considered a medical thing, whereas a pass and fail isn't, which is 
right. which is linguistic, you know, whatever, uh, gymnastics at best. So um, there are, I would suggest that, you know, if, if you do make that decision, it's, it's easy, it's cheap, um, and it certainly makes people feel like, like you're doing something. But, uh, but the reality is, is that they are relatively, you know, inefficient. It's more of a, of a, a CYA for, for production companies to say they're doing it. I, I think the tests are, are, are obviously much better. Right. A, a weekly test is going to tell you a lot more. Yeah, of course. Okay, great. I just want to wrap this up. I just want to say one thing. The whole situation with COVID is ever-changing and very fluid. When in doubt, the most important advice we can give you is follow the law and adhere to the CDC, EPA, and OSHA guidelines and to continue to be up to date on your state and county laws and guidelines where you are shooting. Just want to put that out there. Um, also, uh, if you need to reach Liberty, um, again, her company is the disinfection supply company and Clean Start. And if anybody's interested in her products, she's offering 10% off with the code CLEAN10. Thank you, Liberty. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David and Liberty, for joining us here on the East Coast. You both provided us with such vital information. I think I can speak from everybody here on this webinar that we really, really appreciate it. Um, and again, we want to, um, once we wrap it up, we want, to, we, want, we want to again encourage everyone to at least take the Safe Sets International free COVID-19 production course. It's free, it takes about 30 minutes so that everybody's just getting up to, um, up to speed on what's going on. And thanks everybody for tuning in and please join Peter and the camera department on the Zoom meeting today at 1.30. Eric, are you gonna put that link back up on your Facebook page yeah, too? Yeah, I'll put it up again, yep. Okay, great. And uh, if everybody can join us again next week, July 8th, and our next webinar will be entitled, How We Did It. And our guests have had shoots during COVID and are gonna explain, are going to share what they've learned um, and more information on that webinar will be posted this week on the Surviving the DMV Film Shutdown Facebook page as well as DC Camera. So um, I think we should just wrap it up here. Any date, Liberty or David, do you have any closing thoughts or anything that you can, that maybe we didn't touch upon that's important? No, I think you said it best. There's guidelines for a reason. So, you know, that's the best we can do is just keep following those guidelines, lean on each other. I just put in the comments too, if anyone has questions, please feel free to email me. If I don't know the answer, I will get it for you. So anything to do with disinfection, we will find that answer. So thank you for having me. Perfect. Thank you, David. Anything else from your side of things? Yeah, I would say, I'd say the same thing. Um, I, you know, the thing to know as, as people in the production community, we don't have the answers. We are making a lot of this up. We will be wrong. Um, I, I think even at a government level, you know, we're making it up to a certain extent and we will be wrong and we will modify. And that's important to understand that right now, even though we love to live in our world off of, you know, very long set rules, um, we aren't, uh, these things are changing. And, and we have to know that like what, in all of our documents, we date them. Because, you know, and it says a disclaimer on them, if, if you have this document in your hand and it's over two months old, it's probably out of date because things are just changing. So just know that this is adaptable and next month we may be telling you, hey, everybody has to eat indoors in a non-ventilated space because we don't know. Um, we don't even know how the disease works that well yet. So good luck. It works. I promise you can do it. But, uh, but just be flexible. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, Caprice. Good job. All right.